Hi everyone, it's great to be here. I'm gonna try and cover five years of HL Tower and five questions um, that we've hopefully found some answers to in the previous five years. So I'm gonna start with five questions. Is HL Tower typical? Can the dust gaps be caused by planets? Are the dust gaps caused by planets? Are transitional disks transitional? And are cavities and asymmetries caused by massive companions? So if you don't wanna to listen to my talk, I'll just give you the answers. I think the answers are yes, 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 at least in some cases, not all, probably not any. And yes, it seems likely. So you can tune out now, you can listen to the rest of my talk to find the reasons. So is HL Tower typical? Well, any, anyone who's seen the, uh, uh, the ALMA high resolution survey, such as the D-sharp survey, uh, we've learned very quickly, of course, that there's nothing atypical about having substructures like rings and gaps in disks. And the same story is true from the Taurus survey. You can see rings and substructures and these sort of cavities in the dust emission that we had speculated about before from SED modeling, but now we know that um, they're quite common features in, in disks. So the question of course immediately is, can these dust gaps be caused by planets? And one of the things that threw people off about HL Tau in the first place is that these um, rings and gap structures are really uh, axisymmetric. So um, the reason for that was not clear at the time, uh, but one of the key things that we learned quite quickly here when we're looking at ALMA observations is that we're really looking at a settled distribution of grains. So the millimeter emitting grains appear to be settled to the mid plane. So the dust disk, in other words, is not the same as the gas disk. And that means when we're thinking about planets embedded in the disks, one of the lessons we learned early on is that the gap carving by planets can be very different in that millimeter emitting dust population because it's a much thinner disk and the spiral arms don't propagate in the dust. And so we really need simulations that modeled both the gas and the dust. Um, and so the analogy of course is with large bodies making sort of ring-like structures like gaps in Saturn's rings like Daphnis for example. But when you do models like that, um, so you, you know this absence of spiral structure which was one of the mysteries in HL Tau, you can see the wake structures for these three planets um, in the gas disk on the left. But on the right hand side, we can see that there's um, very just asymmetric, almost circular structures in this settled dust distribution. So the fact that the dust and the gas are decoupled is one of the main explanations for why um, planets might be responsible and why you wouldn't see, you wouldn't expect to see significant non um, axisymmetry in the dust distribution. And indeed, we showed back in 2015 that if you do run this through the telescope simulator um, and put the observations side by side with your simulations, then things seem to work. So in other words, can planets be responsible in HL Tower? Absolutely. Um, you know, we can reproduce the major features with sort of something like Saturn mass planets, maybe up to half a Jupiter mass for the outer one uh, with no spirals in the dust. Um, and this suggests, of course, um, this idea about planet formation being relatively rapid. So what came next? So the answer is yes, the dust caps can be caused by planets. One of the follow-up ideas to this that um, we were particularly uh, found interesting was that you can actually get dust gaps carved by very, very, very small bodies. So where a planet wouldn't even carve a gap in the gas, you would get quite a sharp um, opening in the dust distribution in the settled grain population. Um, that was turned into a full analytic theory by Di Piero and Leib. Um, but it suggests that, you know, small planets are quite detectable in the continuum millimeter emission. Uh, that was immediately followed up by the second long baseline ALMA observations published by Andrews et al. in 2016. Where you can see there's again these wonderful rings in the TW Hydra disk, which is of course our nearest protoplanetary disk at 50 parsecs. But the interesting thing in TW Hydra, so the observations by ALMA are up top right here and the sphere image is on the bottom right, is that this outer gap in particular has no corresponding feature in the scattered light image, indicating that basically it's a dust gap but not a gas gap. And so our modeling of that was able to reproduce this kind of thing, uh, but with very low mass planets. So again, it suggests that you've got pretty low mass bodies in formation, sort of super earth type planets um, that are kind of, while not directly detectable, they're inferred by the ALMA observations. Of course, for this outer quite deep gap that you see in the sphere image, you need a much more massive body. And so again, from modeling um, that suggests, you know, something like a Saturn, now, the nice thing about this field has been over the last five years has been this rapid follow up between theory and observations. So we put a planet in this disk and one of the mysteries in our paper in 2019 was this sort of prominent spiral structure that you see predicted from the models, which is not really, is maybe hinted at in the observations, but not detected. 
but you know some nice follow-up um so we made some synthetic observations in the co emission but uh you know publishing this data in in the d sharp survey in 2018 was a nice follow-up by richard teague where indeed if you subtract the um axisymmetric emission in the co you could see indeed traces of spiral structure uh in the gas which hints to the presence of a large body although um, the match is not perfect but you know again it just illustrates this really nice follow-up um, rapid follow-up that has been in this field between theory and observational um, data but of course um, this idea of you know so planets can definitely do the job but of course there's been no shortage of other ideas proposed um, from all kind of crazy corners of the universe um, and you know everything that disturbs the pressure profile on a disk will also make rings and gaps so of course the real question is you know are the dust gaps really covered by planets so this hypothesized thing is it really the truth of course we now know the answer to that at least in one case um, from this idea of directly kinematically detecting the planet perturbation so Christoph Pant um, made a first detection in 2018 this 2019 one was particularly interesting because uh, the basically the perturbation um, found in the channel map and, and not seen in the opposite channel is very localized in space and velocity and so you can deproject that to where the um, the perturbing body would be and when you deproject it in this HD 97048 you find indeed that that uh, location is exactly where you would expect a planet to be if it was carving this dust gap seen in continuum emission. So at least in one case we can definitely say that a planet is responsible for carving a gap in a protoplanetary disk. Uh, and we can go further than that because we can make models. Again, so we're um, comparing models with observations is valuable here. We can predict not only the dust emission, but also the gas um, channel maps. Uh, and we can see this little kink in the channel maps, uh, which is, corresponds to the kink observed in the observations. And matching models to data means we can kind of read off a mass for this planet um, somewhere between two and three times the mass of Jupiter. Um, and so you can see also Giuseppe's talk for some analytic theory on this. Uh, so we're hoping to turn this into a basically a planet hunting machine in the next five years uh, as a really powerful way of like confirming our ideas, but providing more or less direct detections of planets in embedded in disks. And the prospects are very good for this. So um, Christoph uh, published another paper in 2020 um, mining the D sharp data sets, which are not particularly well suited for kinematics. But even with not particularly well suited data sets, there's hints that these signatures are there and that if we follow them up in more detail, we should be able to provide this kinematic detection of planets um, much more commonly. And of course, other groups have also got ideas for how to interpret the kinematics in terms of a Doppler flip or in terms of um, doing the um, sort of ring average motions to find infalls into the gaps by the T group. Um, but the interesting thing here with the kink kind of method is that all of these planets when deprojected will be located either in a gap or at the tip of a spiral arm seeing the continuum mission. So are planets responsible for gaps? We don't know the full answer yet, but we know that yes, indeed, in some cases. And there's a huge discovery space possible here. Fourth question, are transitional disks transitional? Of course, there's been a huge question over the last sort of 20 years or so um, about this hypothesized um, intermediate class between protoplanetary disk and a debris disk. Um, and the difference now is, of course, we have resolved observations with ALMA and SPHERE um, and other scattered light imaging. So, you know, we have, we confirm first of all that this dust cavity is really a dust cavity in the dust. But one of the mysteries, of course, has always been with the transitional disks that there's inferred to be like the presence of small dust grains or gas um, inside this dust cavity. So while the dust cavity is empty, we seem to have this gas emission inside. And the scattered light imaging has also shown us there's quite often spiral structure and other complicated stuff around the edges of this cavity. And so the traditional debate between photoevaporation or companions, um, this gives us a lot of clues about what the answer might be. Um, and so one of my favorite projects in the last five years has been my involvement in modeling HD 142527, which is this wonderful transitional disk or so-called transitional disk, uh, but where there is a binary companion detected. Um, but the interesting thing there is this binary appears to be on this highly eccentric inclined orbit. Um, and that, that can explain a lot of the weird stuff in this disk, for example, the shadows, from this inclined inner disk, um, you know, the dust horseshoe, which is, you know, the dust kind of collecting in these outer parts of the disk, um, you know, the fact that there's a cavity, you know, so at least in this case, it seems very clear that this is nothing to do with being a transitional class, but it's a really a dynamical uh, interaction. 
So we've tried to roll that out to some of the other um, sort of spectacular transitional disks. So are cavities and asymmetries caused by massive companions? Again, this is not a new idea, but you know, we can put a bit of meat on the bones of the idea by doing some detailed modeling. So for example, IRS 48, it's famous um, for having this kind of dust, um, highly asymmetric dust emission around the cavity. And again, we can reproduce that with simulations showing that in a sort of eccentric binary companion can really do this um, to your dust distribution. But the interesting thing, and again, the giveaway and maybe the theme of my talk is that the giveaway is the kinematics. So the, in the observations, you can see in this moment, one map of the CO emission, this big sort of twist, and you can see indeed that, that that's reflected in our models. Uh, so the models are on the left here. Um, and the observations are on the right. This twist really is the giveaway that there is a massive body in here, even though the body is hidden kind of by the dust emission here, which obscures um, the central object, the, the secondary. Um, so the same story really kind of also works in AB Arriga. So again, we're trying to do very detailed comparison of the uh, this carbon monoxide emission in, in, and the kinematics of this disk. And you can explain that stuff very well um, with an eccentric inclined binary companion, which also explains why there's a cavity there um, and why there's these uh, prominent spiral arms. Uh, so here we need an M dwarf companion. Again, the interesting thing is this companion's on an inclined and eccentric orbit. So not, not some nice circular thing that we thought it might be. Uh, so AB really has been particularly spectacular. And just one final example is MWC 758, which there's been a huge amount of speculation about, um, about whether the there's an external or internal companion um, responsible for driving these spectacular spiral arms detected by Benisti et al. Um, and uh, well, again, modeling suggests that, uh, you know, a relatively massive companion inside the spiral arms could actually do the job explaining not only the cavity, but also these sort of spiral arm structures. Uh, and it would be consistent with whether a, there is indeed a companion detected. So just to summarize, it's been five years since HL Tower. You know, we've been able to answer some of these questions. Is HL Tower typical? The answer is yes. Can the dust gaps be caused by planets? The answer is yes. Are the dust gaps caused by planets? Well, yes, at least in some cases, um, you know, it remains to be seen for all. Are the transitional disks transitional? Well, definitely some of them definitely aren't. They're carved by dynamical interactions. Um, you know, we've been able to do detailed modeling for a few of these spectacular large cavity disks. It's not clear whether that applies to the whole class or not, but we're making progress there. And are the cavities and asymmetries caused by massive companions? This seems quite likely. Um, the modeling seems to work when you try to make the hypothesis um, and you find that the, you need these companions on eccentric and sometimes inclined orbits. So thank you. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the eclipse uh, later on. So uh, great to be here in Chile. Thank you.